Matata and good morning everyone. I think we'll get underway. Uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce uh, Tony Lawson to you. Tony is a member of our board of trustees at Parkinson's New Zealand and is New Zealand's only nurse practitioner with a specialization in Parkinson's. So someone who is a very big asset to the health system and to us parkies. Um, Tony runs practices in Tauranga. So those of you down in the Bay of Plenty will possibly have had the pleasure of of seeing Tony and benefiting from his expertise. But this question of sleeping, Tony, my word, um, if you had said to me that it's one of the biggest challenges I'll face in um, parking my Parkinson's journey, I wouldn't have believed you. But I have uh, had some funny, frustrating experiences with the sleep disturbance. Um, I, I'm on clonazepam, but boy, do I have some psychedelic dreams. <laughs> I wish I could remember them because I think there'd be some really good uh, movie plots in some of them. But I have, uh, I wake up exhausted because my brain is, still feels like it's been going all night. And, um, uh, you know, I'll fall asleep on the couch. Angela will be nudging me saying, it's only seven o'clock and you're falling asleep already. And then I, you know, I'll, I'll go through my sleep hygiene ritual and I get to bed, put my head on the pillow and ping, I'm wide awake again. So, you know, it's a really complex matter for us parties. And so we, we're just so grateful that you're willing to give up your time and your expertise to try and unpack it for us so that if there's some things we can do that just make it a little bit simpler for us uh, and we, we understand it better, then that, that will help us. So thank you so much. Over to you. Thank you, Tom. Oh, thank you, Andrew. Um, I hope I don't put you to sleep with this talk, actually. So I'll be watching you. <laughs> I'm just going to share my screen for a moment. So I'm just wondering, is that um, view, can you see that uh, screen, Andrew? Yeah, nothing's changed, Tony. Oh. Nothing's changed. I'll just give me a moment. A moment ago. There we go. There we like, go. All right. I'm just going to bring up um, the screen for a moment. With working for uh, Fata Aura DHB, we have lots of different um, sort of sites we have to go through to open. Our items of interest due to precautions of um, privacy. So I'm just going to bring it up now. There we go. Great. So if you just launch it now, there we go. All right. So that's reasonably clear. Yes, thank you, Tony. So there's Andrew trying to get to sleep initially. Why eyes wide open? So um, this talk is going to really um, go in depth a bit about sleep. And I'm going to um, divide it into three parts. So the first part is really to outline the biology of sleep. Uh, what is the biological clock and what is the circadian rhythm? Uh, sleep is quite a busy time and we'll go through this, how the brain uses sleep and what we term sleep architecture, just be fancy, how it's structured. And interestingly is to describe how we slept in the pre-industrial times and the impact on modern society, on our sleep now. And finally, the third part will be on how sleep fragmentation or the pattern of sleep and Parkinson's syndromes, Parkinson's disease and other conditions like Parkinson's, um, how it affects sleep. 
push yourselves uh, with those with Parkinson's. So I went to our medical library and I took up these five kilo, two volume books on sleep. And I thought, yes, it is not a, um, a topic for the faint hearted, to be honest. Um, so biology of sleep. So in this discussion, uh, we're gonna talk about circadian rhythm segmented sleep stages and peripheral clocks. So the circadian rhythm. Just going to put my pointer to a laser it might be better. The circadian rhythm is the waking hours that have a certain rhythm. And the 24 hour cycle of the Earth's rotation has resulted in us human sleeping pattern that is largely takes place at night. And for our little endemic fairy kiwis, it's during the day. But we're not fairy kiwis. Some may be. So does disturbing the circadian rhythm cause health problems? So yes, there's clear evidence to suggest that it does. Shift workers like myself in younger days as a nurse working all night, for instance, uh, would be if I continued uh, to be at risk of cardiovascular disease. This is evidence-based. And one study found that they were 40% more likely to suffer from this illness compared with non-shift workers. So what is the biological clock? And why do our bodies follow a circadian rhythm? The central master clock of the suprachiasmatic nucleus, a mouthful, of a word is a collection of about 20,000 oscillating nerve cells in the part of the brain called a hypothalamus, a little area. And this is intricately linked with daylight from the optic nerve of the eye. So, the internal clock signals when it's time to be awake or asleep, and it's linked with hormone levels and body temperature, which is correspondingly fluctuates over a circadian rhythm of about a day. Be interesting if we all go to Mars one day, what will happen then? So, segmented sleep is in sync with our body clocks. So we have a segmented sleep pattern and stages, and we'll go through that shortly. Um, but it, it does in sync to what the body clocks are doing inside us. And we'll talk about the body clocks a little bit later. So most people are tired at the end of the day. Following dinner, for example, your body soon is producing insulin to balance sugar levels. And this causes the release of amino acid tryptophan to move into the brain, which is then converted into serotonin and melatonin, which you may well have heard of. Together, these neurotransmitters have a calming effect and your eyes start to close. So, segmented sleep stages. So sleep isn't just a solid eight hours. It is actually broken down into stages. But sleep isn't just a time to power down for the brain. We're actually quite active. We have segmented sleep stages. It's a period when the biological processes that maintain our body kick in from the release of growth hormones to the consolidation 
of memories that we've made throughout the day. And contrary to what we might expect, sleep also means a period of activity. And I think for people with Parkinson's disease, this is uh, an area of um, concern and we'll discuss that in part three. So the sleep architecture is what we call this process. And I'm sorry, this is just a bit of a fuzzy slide to show you, but with sleep architecture, we have different stages of being awake, which is this orange yellow line here. And then over eight hours time of sleep, there are different stages, stage one to three. There's a stage four, but we tend to think of three stages. And in these stages, there is cycles of non-REM sleep and REM sleep. And I'm going to show you a, um, a graph about that uh, shortly. Can I just interrupt you for a second? Because we've just not seen your slides displaying very clearly because for some reason we've got two slides on the on the screen. Oh. Uh, uh, all right, let me just um, alter display settings. One, two. You can just see the one slide that you're speaking to that would make it. Yeah, yes, I didn't realize that, sorry. Just one moment. Is that better? That's better. Thank you so much. Oh, yes, sorry. I was showing you my um, two slides at once, which wouldn't help to try and see these pictures. Yes, that's much so, better. Yeah, thanks for that, Andrew. So in sleep architecture, um, this is really the area that I like to talk about a bit with you, actually. Um, so I'm going to spend a few minutes on this. So sleep architecture is a basic pattern of normal sleep. And you experience two main types of sleep, rapid eye movement or REM sleep and non-rapid eye movement, non-REM sleep. And it comes in these three stages, which all feature different depths of sleep and can be identified by brainwave patterns, eye movements, and muscle tone. And this is a EEG that shows these different brainwave patterns. And when we awake, we have this continual pattern, which is quite active. And in different stages, it changes. So I'm just going to leave this up on the screen and talk to you about sleep architecture. Typically, we go through about four to five different uh, sleep cycles during the night, and each is a different cycle, lasting about 90 minutes and up to two hours. And some cycles will contain all three phases of this sleep, non-REM sleep stages. And I'm going to talk a little bit about these. These are quite important. So in this particular stage here, non-REM sleep, I'll just get that pointer to laser. In this stage here, uh, you've just drifted off to sleep. This is just going off to sleep. You're usually not consciously aware of your surroundings, but easy to be jarred awake. And if you're awakened, you may not even realize you've fallen asleep. And this phase um, in sleep is relaxed muscles. The body temperature starts to drop and slow side to side eye movements might be seen if somebody's watching your eyes. And the brain waves here transition from these rhythmic waves to mixed frequency or theta waves. I don't want to turn you into export experts because you might want to read those big two volumes on sleep if you get terribly interested. 
However, so this stage lasts about 10 minutes. And we do come back into it during the night sometimes. You may return to it, but it's not necessary at every cycle through the night. The amount of time you spend in this stage increases with age, actually, and makes it harder to fall asleep and stay asleep. So the next area I want to talk about is we're deepening our sleep now, and we go into stage two, non-REM sleep. So once you're fully asleep, you enter this non-REM stage two sleep cycle, and it's more difficult to awaken you at this phase. But the brain waves show that certain amount of vigilance remains. For instance, if you make a loud noise or whisper in someone's name, or someone does that in your ear, it's noted on the EEG, some changes. So during this stage, this lack of eye movement now, and a continued drop of body temperature, more regular breathing and heart rate occurs, and you get rapid bursts of brain activity called sleep spindles. And these are the sleep spindles here. So during sleep spindles, uh, when you've learned a significant amount of new information, which you are today, you might be spindling away tonight. And what it does is that it loads, it shows that the brain is now uh, processing the memories, consolidating memories that are useful, and other memories tend to not get locked down or consolidated, so it's sorting it through. I will go down further. So we're getting to stage three and four, or stage three, non-REM sleep, and these are called delta waves. It's a deep sleep, slow wave cycle, and this is when it's the hardest to wake you up. This phase is believed to be essential for restorative sleep, which is when your body repairs itself and allows you to awaken feeling refreshed. So non-REM sleep stage three appears to be important for memory and creativity. And this is um, described as a more increased relaxation of your muscles decrease pulse and breathing, and less blood flow to the brain, release the growth hormone for tissue repairs, and an increase immune activity, immune system activation. So you spend more time in this phase early in the night when it may last up to 40 minutes, quite an important stage and that's why the first few hours of sleep is important. Later on, this phase gets shorter and REM phases get longer. You may not be part of the later cycles as the night progresses. So let's have a little talk about REM sleep. So REM sleep is the deepest state of sleep. And it's when you dream. Just as non-REM 3 is when the body is restored, experts believe REM sleep is when the body, when the brain is restored and prepared for the next day. This phase is characterized by muscle immobility, increased breathing rate, heart rate, blood pressure up to daytime levels, increased body temperature, bursts of rapid eye movements, rapidly going back and forth, increased brain activity. So you can certainly see this in mammals, don't you? So cats and dogs, you might see their eyes flickering away and their little paws doing some movements. Consistent interruptions during REM sleep can lead to a host of potential 
issues. And for some unfortunate people, um, they get this uh, sleep paralysis when they're awake but can't move muscles. And that can occur in um, teenagers during those stages. And parasomnias can occur walking around and, and other issues. So that's in the junior population. And we'll come to some of these issues later in our third part of the talk. So remember, everybody's different with these things, and uh, certainly what makes a difference in all this is one's uh, sex, the time of day you sleep, how much time you allocate to your sleep, use of caffeine, nicotine, alcohol, marijuana, and other drugs, and underlying sleep disorders that we might just touch upon uh, later on, such as someone who's had insomnia all your lives, or somebody with sleep apnea with problems with um, their breathing during sleep, or somebody who's got some severe depression and other issues in their lives that affect sleep. So we've really talked quite in depth about the sleep architecture. So I'm going to go on and talk about other things like peripheral clocks. There's been this um, recent discovery of peripheral clocks and it makes sense really because um, in our peripheral clocks in our body, um, for example, um, our bodies are attuned to awakening at certain times and different organs. Eating, for instance, can reset the peripheral clock of the gastrointestinal tract. So that's why you don't want to eat too much during the night. So where are these, where are these peripheral clocks? So um, each tissue and cell has its own molecular clock. The peripheral clocks are also in organs like the liver, the lungs, the heart, bone marrow, and we start to see it importantly in the immune system as well. So the important aspects of these is that often uh, the daylight, the circadian rhythm we talked about, um, affects how light occurs in the early morning, and we need to be outside to be honest, for at least 10 minutes um, to allow this light to go through our optic nerves to stimulate the suprachiasmatic nucleus, um, the master clock. And all these signals reset these peripheral clocks. And these are challenging word for me to say, Zeitgebers, Gebers, I can't say it, contributing to an entrainment of sensual peripheral clocks. So light, food, temperature, and social activities are all contributors. So when is the best time to sleep in order to be alert and creative? Sleeping in one eight-hour stint may not be right for everyone. And Karen states, I have switched to a bimodal or segmented sleep pattern, she says. I go to sleep with my kids at eight or so and wake up at 10-ish and work for a few hours. And then I go back to sleep and wake up with the kids in the morning. There is some evidence this is not unusual sleep pattern in the pre-industrial stage. And we're going to talk in, about this in our part two. So in this um, engraving from 1595, a histor his histor historian professor, Roger Ekerich, United States, has identified um, in his study in the old days, going back two or 300 years, that we certainly had 
a different sleep pattern. And here's an engraving of some of a family, say, during the night. There's a cat by the fireside. Uh, there's a lady, she's gone to sleep, probably doing some craft work or knitting. Um, I heard on a national radio, uh, I think, a talk where as people awake during the night, uh, this lady, she just wants to sort out different socks, measures, put socks together that are not set. Doing something that's very basic and non-challenging to the brain is what she does. And here's another person just helping a person who's in bed with drinking or feeding. So these activities occur and more activities have been identified. During the wake cycle, uh, waking period between their sleeps, uh, communities and villages were quite active. People often got up, went to toilets, smoked tobacco, and some even visited neighbours. You try doing that these days. Most people stayed in bed, read, wrote, and often prayed. And these countless prayer manuals from the late 15th century showing special prayers at certain hours during the night. And certainly that's part of uh, religious uh, orders that um, do that during the night still. So sleep pattern changes with industrial society. And Urquhart found that references to first and second sleep started to disappear during the late 17th century. And this started among urban upper classes in Northern Europe. And over the course of the next 200 years, filtered down to the rest of Western society. And at the awakening of your first sleep, you shall have a hot drink made. And at the awakening of your next sleep, your sorrows will have a slake or dissipated. An old early English ballad. But things changed. The culprit was Thomas Edison, light bulb moment. With the invention of the light bulb, the night was now illuminated with lamplight and became a time for activity. The early sleep at dusk quickly fell out of favour. There was too much fun to have stories, doing activities. As a result, we went to bed later and ended up mashing these two smaller sleep patterns into one big one. And what about technology these days? iPads, phones, computers. And our young people seem to be hardwired and, into these items and is concerning about their sleep hygiene and pattern now. So Sleeping Beauty, it's a bit of a myth really that we enter this state. Sleep's very important and I certainly value it. But it's a busy time if we, as we have described so far. So we're now entering into our last part of our talk, part three, regarding sleep and Parkinson's disease. And a few topics around that, sleep problems, anxiety, exercise, and the latest of interest to us is this thing called the glymphatic system, which I'll just briefly mention, and diet. So as Andrew alluded to, sleep is actually 90 and some literature 96% a common problem with people with Parkinson's disease. PWP. It is a, considered a circadian rhythm disorder and features fragmented rest activity cycles, progressive deterioration in motor function as the day progresses. And this is a common feature I find in my clinical practice is this progression through the day, especially after lunch in the afternoon, is this plateau. 
it doesn't matter if a person is in a reasonably stable position with medication or those advanced uh, complications that require lots of medication changes. It seems to be a pattern and we relate it to this altered circadian rhythm disorder during the day. Hard to treat, it's suggested we should do what they do in um, the hotter parts of the world, which is have a siesta or a little sleep after lunch. Do your most activity during the morning when you're at best. So due to the circadian rhythm disorder, it reduces the effect of Parkinson's medications throughout the day and associated with neuropsychiatric disturbances. Don't get too thrown by that. It just is a common feature that um, hallucinations may emerge during towards the evening. And this is, um, can be just a, a peripheral disturbance in a vision, a, a movement, could be like a little black mouse or cat or of tree moving. The brain tries to interpret what that little bit of brief movement was. Um, and it's termed a, as a hallucination. Very common, doesn't worry anyone, and we're not worried, it's just there. So why towards the evening? Well, we think with circadian rhythm, you know, we talked about we cycle around the sun, and the sun in the morning has this blue UV light, the best light uh, for us to reset our clocks we talked about, and also the best time for us to come into sync during the day when we do activities. Probably thousands of years ago, whatever it was, we were out hunting, um, catching the beast, and during the day, during over that day, dragging it back to the caves and uh, handing it over. Um, and then the meal would be then, and then the sun, that blue UV light changes over lunchtime, the zenith of the sun, and now becomes a yellow to orange to red UV light colours, and that resets us towards the evening. So the reset in the evening is when we start getting into um, sleep mode, and that's when we can bring on some of these activities of hallucinations. However, with REM sleep behavior disorders, which is very common, and we call that RBD, I didn't put it up here, but REM sleep behavior disorders occurs, uh, people with Parkinson's may well experience this, and it can, can go back quite a few years or decades actually, that during the normal dream state, you know, think about sleep architecture going down from non-REM to REM stages, during normal dreaming, the link between the dreaming circuits and the movement regions of the brain is turned off. So a person with Parkinson's with this condition, um, sorry, a person with this normally uh, is turned off and that person lies quiet and moving, not moving at all, yet in Parkinson's, 30% uh, of people, this connection remains turned on, I should say. And a person acts out their dreams in the form of vocalizations, talking, shouting, sometimes threatening, thrashing, punching, and kicking. Sounds quite a busy time. Uh, however, it does happen. Um, I've got the odd um, evidence of a, a couple uh, from years ago. He was an electrician. And in his dream state, there was two large, um, important electrical cables that had come loose that needed to be put together. And um, disconcerting for his wife, it was her legs uh, that he was trying to reconnect together. So it doesn't mean that it happens so dreadfully, but sometimes at night, if you're sharing a bed with a partner, um, it's good for the partner to understand what's happening. It's in a dream state usually. Sometimes the use of a long uh, pillow uh, in the bed, just uh, if it's an issue, 
or possibly if it's that bad, might require in separate beds, possibly. But this is a feature that often it needs to be discussed. Um, and sometimes partners are a little bit nervous because they didn't want to say, oh, you know, my spouse is sort of doing a slight punch or something. The other aspect to all this is that it's not refreshing in the morning awakening and excessive daytime sleepiness can occur and people feel very fatigued. Sleeping during the day it affects 50% of people with Parkinson's. It may also be due, as I mentioned slightly earlier in the talk about insomnia, sleep apnea and medications that produce sleepiness. Yes, yeah, so how to optimize sleep hygiene. Uh, Andrew slightly mentioned about sleep hygiene in the beginning. Yes, it, it is useful to have a ritual. Um, my ritual is I was the youngest of nine in my family. So we, as kids, we had to wash our feet at night before getting into bed, I think to preserve the sheets maybe. So that's a little pattern I have. It's common in Japan, I gather, is that, that ritual of cleansing the feet. So that's my ritual, odd as it is. So there's some other hints here. After dinner, work on a hobby or go for a stroll. Avoid television in the evening. There's not much really of quality is there. But Netflix has taken over all other areas with um, people getting caught up and watching serial programs. So just be aware of this and to avoid too much stimulation. Avoid extreme exercise in the evening, but you know, just a moderate walk or stroll, as mentioned here, is helpful. Avoid having a coffee after 2 p.m. And this is caffeine and Coca-Cola, tea, and other stimulants. Avoid alcohol before bed. Alcohol for person might think it helps them to fall asleep, but it, during the night it puts the foot on accelerator, actually, and you have this disturbed um, sleep stages at night, disturbing a vital REM sleep in the early hours of the morning. And the latest discussion about alcohol is not just moderate, but to abstain, so that's just a thought to share with you, really. Sleep in a quiet, dark, cool room. So I know in winter we like to have warmth, certainly have a warm room and that's very important, uh, but don't leave the, um, the electric blanket on. Because as we described, the body is going through different stages of cooling during the night. And you don't want to be overheated. So these are temperature ranges, 16 to 19 at night um, and keep warm during the day. And I do, um, state keeping warm is important for people with Parkinson's disease. Um, so make sure you layer up with um, clothes. Keep the clock, television, iPad and phone out of sight, even if they're not being used. Having these distractions in the bedroom will keep your body in a more alert state. And I'm a poor preacher here because I do have all this stuff charging in the room. I should think about moving them out uh, into another area. Stop staring at the clock, remove it from sight and turn off that alarm unless you really need it. So just a few closing things before we end. Um, anxiety is pronounced um, with Parkinson's. Russell Foster, Professor of Circadian Neuroscience at Oxford shares this point of view. The idea that we must sleep in a consolidated block could be damaging, he says, if it makes people who wake up at night anxious, as this anxiety can itself prohibit sleeps and is likely to seep into the waking life as well. Many people wake up at night in panic. I tell them that what that what they are experiencing is a throwback to the bi-model sleep pattern. 
But what I understand really is that the brain at night is going through a lot of processes. And the areas of the brain called limbic areas are the areas that um, creates a lot of emotion. Um, and, and sometimes you can have this altered sleep daydream, nighttime dreams that you might be chasing something or you've been chased or you have to do something. It's a sort of anxiety provoking stuff sometimes that can occur. And now part of our brain in front, the prefrontal cortex that makes rational decisions seems to diminish a bit during sleep. So what I'm trying to say is things why I seem a little bit worse at night than they are in the morning. So what's beneficial for the brain is exercise, improves cognitive function, enhances brain clearance and reduces this accumulation of alpha synuclein. It's these bodies that get disposed or should be disposed of, but linger outside the cells of the neurons. So we're now realizing that the brain has a system to drain away through the, through the lymphatic system, the lymph system. And I'm just going to show you this next, just briefly. It's called a glymphatic function. So I know you may not be able to see this very well, but this is the glymphatic system. And the neurons here, the nerves, that's to do with Parkinson's, for example, um, they might have a buildup of these alpha synuclein bodies. And clearance of these is sometimes not working very well at all. So this is the brain's natural waste clearance or toilet system, I would say, for us, and this occurs a lot at night. So um, hard to read, sorry, but if you have insufficient clearance, it can disturb the sleep, increase stress, raise blood pressure, and high levels of alcohol are contributors to this. And for effective brain clearance that works well, it improves your sleep, vascular health, exercise helps, and low levels as we described earlier of alcohol. So lifestyle modifications, very important, your diet, uh, exercise, and reduce alcohol or no alcohol. So diet, here we often get um, asked about this and there's a lot of research that shows the Mediterranean diet is proving to be the best in a sense. I know there's ketogenic diets and other diets. Um, however, the mainstay is the Medi Mediterranean diet. Uh, high fat and high sugar diet increases alpha synuclein accumulation that we just mentioned that needs to be cleared and often decades um, for this to manifest. So it's a good education point to live healthily and to let others know in our families and younger ones to be mindful about their diet and exercise for general health. So there are some products that can help polyunsaturated fatty acids and margarines. You can get an omega-3 uh, margarine, I think it's helpful, and omega um, in some capsule formulations. As we talked about again, I won't go over that again. And there's some references I have from uh, my talk. And thank you. For your time to listen to this talk. I'll hand over to Andrew. Thank you, Tony. Um, you covered a lot of ground there for us. Thank you very much indeed. Um, and so if you have any questions, please, if you could pop them into the Q&A, if you just go down your hover at the bottom, you'll see a Q&A section and um, you can just pop those in for the next uh, 15 minutes. We'll, we'll answer some questions. Um, we do stick to the hour, so it will just be for about, we'll deal with as many of the questions as we can. So the first one is a really interesting one for me, Tony, by, uh, sent in by Linda. 
Um, because this is something that my elderly mum has done for many, many years, is used the radio. So she'll have the radio on at night, and she'll, I think she, I think she comes in and out of sleep uh, by using the radio. So Linda's asking, is this a bad idea to use the radio to help us go to sleep? And then it's playing all through the night. Do you have an opinion yeah. on that? I mean, I think the reality is that um, the brain is still alert to some degree. And um, there's two things, I think, for Linda's mum, is that it's been habitual. It's been something she's done for a long time. And maybe it's the, what I call brown noise or grey noise of just the radio that might be doing it rather than um, absorbing or listening to what's been said. However, uh, my advice is to avoid talk back, avoid anything stimulating um, in what you listen to at night. However, there's also um, a lot of uh, apps and things that can provide um, sleep background music, um, white music, I'm trying to think what it's called now, um, and it can help some people, like gentle waves uh, or sounds of the forest, um, that gentle type of music that might induce sleep. Um, ideally, it's, it's a quiet, blackened out background in your room. But yeah, what helps works. Um, but yeah, I think maybe for her mum, it's that um, many years of just that, um, it's a quiet grey matter noise, or, or in other words, you know, it's, maybe she's not being overstimulated with it, but I wouldn't normally recommend use of a radio. radio. I know you, the, that white noise, my grandson, who's about 15 months old now, mm. uh, by the my son and daughter-in-law started by playing this white noise. It sounds mm. kind of like wind blowing. It's just this noisy thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now my son claims he can't go to sleep unless he's got the white noise on as well. So Absolutely. It's totally habitual to have yes. some sort. Of, and what I found myself with the sleep hygiene is um, is that ritualistic sort of thing where I have a sleep tea, a chamomile sleep tea type thing, you know, just a warm drink. Yes. And I find having my shower, you spoke about washing your feet, well, a good old South African habit is we really shower at night. Right. And, uh, yeah. I shower so that I, I'm warm and I'm preparing myself. And certainly that having yes. all the gadgets charging outside the room, all of those sleep hygiene yeah. tactics have yes. helped me. Um, right. Even though I still have quite a bit of sleep. Yes. Um, yes. That does right. So another question then is... Uh, can you give us some tips on how to deal with insomnia and the good old restless legs? Mm. Um, and how mm. much how much do we need to sleep? Um, what, yeah. you know, what what's the target? Um, yes. and, and do we what happens if we sleep during the day? Do we sort of like add that together? So if it's four hours during the day and four hours at night, or is it do you have to get eight hours at night? Yes. Well, to comment people? on yeah, well, to comment on that, that's a very good question. I I would state that. Um, when we get older, that stages of sleep cycles changes. And uh, certainly if you were uh, a young teenager, 18, you would be having deeper, longer sleep cycles than you are when you're older. So when you're older, I feel um, an adequate sleep would be six, seven hours, five, six, seven hours. And most people I see in clinic with Parkinson's, often um, they may go to bed at half past nine at night, maybe, um, and they awaken to go to the toilet. It's not too many times because we can look at that as well, what's happening there, disrupt their sleep. But often if they wake, um, they might well wake up about four o'clock in the morning. And to tell you the truth, I'm not worried because this is a wakeful sleep stage. And as I see these peripheral clocks, so the liver actually starts to wake up at four. So does the kidneys, because you're meant to be out hunting the wildebeest nearly at that time. So often it's that aspect. Sorry, you're from South Africa. You understand that, don't you? Yeah, uh, Andrew? Right. <laughs> yes, <you're> right. <laughs> uh, but the reality is that awakening early is very common. It's a wakeful state. And uh, as I said, don't overstimulate yourself at that time. If you want to get a drink, fine, but don't um, pick up like your iPad or watch TV. Um, 
best to try and rest. The other question is about this restlessness in the leg. Uh, cramping or muscle tone tension um, with lack of um, medicine like Sinemet or Madapa or Levodopa at night can bring on an intense muscle tone or rigid stiffness and cramping also is an aspect there. So simple aspects to take magnesium aspartate, which is the better magnesium now. So clinicians range, they have uh, clinician 625 and I'll take one capsule at night and one capsule in the morning. And that helps with the magnesium calcium transfers and muscle fibers. So that will help with cramps. Too much magnesium, huge amounts or might bring on loose motion. So, but that amount is fine. Uh, the other aspect is what is we find with restless legs, we actually need to treat, particularly with some people with real restless legs at night, it's just terrible. Uh, we use a medication and you mentioned clonazepam. So clonazepam is a, a drug that can help in small doses um, at night and adjusted as required. Um, the other thing I just picked up with you, Andrew, you mentioned you couldn't get off to sleep that quickly at night, is that right? You find it difficult getting off to sleep. Yes, even though I might have been dozing in front of the television. Yes. And I into bed. Right. And I seem to be very alert. Right. Um, yeah, simple things, take a couple of Panadol at night, just takes the edge off. Um, and if needed, there's melatonin that can help just a little bit uh, for those to get off to sleep. There's one of the questions from Dennis, he's asking is melatonin a good idea? It works somewhat, it's modest benefit. Um, it can be prescribed um, probably up to three milligrams at night. It's a natural... Um, you know how we talked about how the brain converts uh, some neurotransmitters into melatonin, it's a natural product. And often it is used um, with success. It's for those only who have difficulty getting off to sleep. It's not for those who awaken during the night. Um, so often uh, some medications we use, um, the melatonin, I'd suggest two hours before sleep, if it was, um, Difficulty with sleep pattern, sometimes with restless legs, um, REM sleep behavior, you might prescribe a dopamine agonist like ropinirol, and that works quite well. But I'm getting into a bit of a lengthy talk, aren't I? A bit of be quiet. Okay. Uh, so someone's just asking clonazepam, the spelling of it, Tony, is it it's C L O N? Yes, C L O N A Z. E P A M, so clonazepam, it's a low dose antipsychotic, which is very low dose, um, but it works for us um, in helping with the uh, restless legs. Um, uh, but it, it's a medication we tend to use with um, usually a specialist uh, service like ourselves, I work with, or discussing with a GP, because you need to explore other reasons first, you know, what are the issues um, in regards to what's causing the problem to sleep. So Sharon's just commenting that she found the rain app, um, uh, you know, the noise uh, to be very useful as a background app, the, the mm -hmm. white noise we were talking about a little bit earlier, she's found one that the sound of rain is mm -hmm. helpful to her. And mm -hmm. then another person just uh, saying, thanking you for the talk, Tony, but asking, if you could comment on uh, the support partner whose sleep has been disturbed by the by the person with Parkinson's, mm. uh, you did you did allude to you know, this can become a, a, a I think a point of stress and of conflict. Yes. yes. Uh, can you comment on that? What, what should carers uh, do? Quality of life is so important in a relationship, isn't it? And the quality of a couple with their relationship is very important. So often. Uh, a partner or a spouse will will try and tolerate uh, sleep disturbance, but it can be enduring in regards to chronic um, 
sleep deprivation themselves, of course. Um, so I state a relationship isn't bonded to that you share a bed. You know, often it's needed sometimes that you do sleep separately. Doesn't mean it alters anything. But, you know, if you're us disturbed that night, um, see how you get on. Everybody's individual. I don't want to be... Um, you know, caught up in causing marriage problems. But I would say just don't put up with if it's disturbing your sleep, both of you uh, have problems, then I think it's pragmatic that you uh, you have a better sleep. And that might mean just a separate area in the room or, or whatever works for you. I, I remember when um, when my dad was getting fairly advanced with his Parkinson's mum was just exhausted because mm. she was she was waking up five, six times a month. And so mm. she wasn't able to provide the care during mm. the day because she literally just yeah. like, wasn't sleeping. So it, is, it does get to that stage. Um, so uh, just a question, Tony. Uh, is there, is there uh, it's not a medication I've heard of, clonazepam. Uh, how is that related to clonazepam? Sorry, can you just repeat that word? Clonazepam, T A M A D. Oh, yes. So, so that's an old-fashioned um, medication. I say it's old-fashioned. It's, it's a sedative. And it's used years ago, temazepam. So uh, I think it still can be prescribed. But a comment we personally, uh, well, not personally, but in the profession, the use of sedatives is, is not ideal. Because um, you know how that sleep architecture, all that sleep pattern is so important. Uh, if you over sedated, it disturbs that, and it's not good. It's, sometimes during a crisis, uh, a sleeping pill may well help to get through. Some people are on low dose sleeping tablets, um, but everybody's individual member, and I think you just need to be led by your general practitioner what works for you. Um, but it's just a comment that we don't ideally like long-term use of um, sleeping pills. So temazepam is one of the old class of sleeping tablets. And if somebody's been on that for a long, long time, it may well be appropriate because that's how it, it is for that particular person. But um, yeah, hard to talk individually, isn't it, in this type yeah. of webinar, really? Mm. Yeah. Uh, so a lot of... Um... Uh, promotion of um, satin sheets, you know, to help with movement. Uh, and uh, I think some people say pajamas, others say no pajamas at all. Mm. Any comments on sort of like bed yes. clothes, heavy duvets, yeah. or blankets, or yes, I, I think uh, there's two things there. One of the most difficult things is turning in bed, actually, and a lot of people suffer from. Uh, a freedom of fluidity of movement to turn in bed, great difficulty. Um, so satin sheets or equivalent um, or uh, shorts uh, for, for the males might help just with reduced friction and turning. Um, the body temperature does change during the night. And um, so just be aware of uh, loading up too much uh, the weight of the blankets and so on. Um, yeah, it just depends how it's compressing on your body. Some people use different means to have a lighter but warm covering uh, rather than heavy blankets. Some people use um, some simple box or cardboard box at the end of the bed to lift over the feet. Mm. Sounds, you know, these different things that people use. Um, yeah, so just be aware of that. If you are moving a lot in bed and the blankets flying everywhere, you probably need to think about that and, and how much you're putting on. Is that answering that question? Yeah. And then maybe just the last one, because uh, our time is nearly up. Um, as I alluded to, uh, that I had this experience where I can fall asleep and I'll be watching television and um, mm. next thing I'll wake up, I have no recollection of falling asleep. It's not like I get drowsy and I close mm. my eyes. Mm. I've just mm. gone. Mm. So I've got actually a bit worried about driving at night because mm. is it possible that I could just fall asleep at the wheel? Yes. Well, there's a sudden onset sleep 
syndrome where you can actually suddenly go to sleep. And we ask lots of questions. We ask, do people go to sleep when they wake up and at breakfast they might just nod off that quickly? That they just, at the table, they might nod off, strangely. Uh, do they find that, um, do they have a pre-warning that they might get very sleepy, if not? And these micro-sleeps where you can just nod off that quickly. And often challenging times is after meals. So your blood is diverted to digest the meal. So postprandial, they call it, after meal, you can have these um, episodes, not enough oxygen getting to the brain, and it might uh, precipitate a, a micro-sleep, nodding off. And you feel challenged with all that while you're driving, then it's concerning, isn't it? So you just need to modify what you're doing. So if you need to drive, do it pre-meals in the morning, maybe. Um, just be aware of that. Um, is that helpful, Andrew? Yes, very much so. I hadn't sort of connected it to the meal time, but now that you say that, yes, it is always, it's yes. never before the meal, it's always after the meal. Yes, big feasts. We often, um, in the ED department of hospital at Christmas, get people postprandial fainting, right? Yeah. Because they're, they're digesting the turkey and the pudding. <laughs> right. Mm. Well, Tony, thank you so much for your time and your expertise. Um, we've had a big crowd of people listening in and uh, some great questions as well. So really grateful. Um, just so that everyone knows, if you'd like to listen again to Tony's uh presentation you will be sent a link this was recorded and you will be sent a link in the next few days so that you can watch it online or alternatively uh, it is going to be repeated again at 7 p.m for this evening but you have to register for the 7 p.m slot if you can't use the same link that you've used for this one but you can do that through the course of the day if you'd like to join in again tonight but thank you everyone for your participation and for your questions and thank you big thank you to you tony for your time thank you everyone Bye -bye. I hope you sleep well from this point on. <laughs> Thank you, Tony, for all the good tips. You're welcome.